Let's turn to John chapter 17. We're going to get right into the Word of God this morning. How many of you are ready to receive the Word of God today? I said, how many of you are ready to receive the Word of God today? Amen. John chapter 17, uh, starting in verse 20. Let's read that together. Uh, Well, you can listen as I read, but follow along together. John 17, verse 20. I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me, the glory that you have given me, I have given to them that they may be one even as we are one. I in them and you in me that they may become perfectly one so that the world may know that you sent me and loved them even as you loved me. Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me may be with me where I am to see my glory that you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, even though the world does not know you, I know you, and these know that you have sent me. I made known to them your name, and I will continue to make it known that the love with which you have loved me may be in them and I in them. Lord, thank you for your word. Let it be life to us today. Uh, Stir our hearts with the truth of the Word of God. In Jesus' name, amen. This passage today is about you, is about me, is about the believer, is about those who have, since the uh, beginning of the, the church, have come to faith in Christ through the preaching and teaching of the gospel. Jesus here is praying for you, is praying for me. This is the end of the high priestly prayer, what this prayer is known as. This is the end of the prayer between the Son and the Father. Jesus praying to the Father. And you will notice in the next chapter that the header for chapter 18 is the betrayal and arrest of Jesus. And so this prayer, the end of this prayer, right on the heels of the cross, Jesus turns his his eyes and his thoughts and his affection and his heart towards you, towards the believer. And first, Jesus has prayed for himself to be glorified so that the Father would be glorified. We see that in the beginning of this chapter. And then Jesus goes on to pray for the disciples that they would be in the world, that they would not be taken out of the world, but that they would remain in the world to be protected from the evil one so that they could be lights to the world. And it's because of the Uh, fulfillment of that prayer that you and I stand here or sit here today with faith in Christ because they were resolute in their mission to carry on the gospel, to be lights in an evil world. This was Jesus' prayer for the disciples, and today Jesus prays for us. Jesus is facing his biggest challenge as a man set right before him at this very moment. Just put yourself in this setting. Jesus is facing the greatest challenge of any man, knowing that the crucifixion is coming. Now, the reason this makes it such a great challenge, not not just in a sense of the, the physical Uh, agony that awaits Christ. But he went to the cross willingly, okay? Anybody else in, in history 
When they went to the cross to be crucified, it was not willingly. It was because they had committed a crime or they had committed something deemed a crime and whether they liked it or not, they were to be crucified. Jesus was not like that. Now on the outside to uh, the Pharisees and and the the Sanhedrin and, and the Roman rule and the mob, it seemed as though Jesus Uh, was not wanting to be crucified. But we know because Jesus is God revealed uh, revealed in the flesh as man, we know through scripture that Jesus came to the world to save the lost. That it was his mission to go to the cross. And so the most difficult part that Jesus faces right here. The the reason this is the biggest challenge is because he is willingly going to the cross. And so this is the challenge set before Jesus, the crucifixion. Yet his mind and his heart, even though this is the looming thing, his mind and his heart is full with thoughts and intention for you and me Today, that's just an incredible reality. Verse 20, we we read it, but we see that it says, Jesus says, I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. Their word speaking of the disciples. Jesus here is praying for all future believers, those that have come to Christ since this day and those in the future that will come to Christ. Jesus is praying specifically for them. How is he able to do this, you might be asking? Well, if we put it in the scope of Jesus' mission, the the crucifixion that that is before him focuses, it it, it, that whole focus of the crucifixion is his attention towards believers because the cross is the only way to produce future believers, right? Jesus, when he looks to the cross, he has to think about you and me because he thought about us. The Bible says that that before, when 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 God tells Jeremiah that before I formed you in your mother's womb, I knew you. That, that talks about how God, before we were ever a twinkle in our parents' eye, he formed us. He knew us. He had intent towards us. Now, certainly that uh, encapsulates the mission of redemption, that Jesus thought of us before he came to the earth to die for us. Think about that. He thought about you individually, specifically, What an incredible reality. And so when Jesus is is seeing the cross, he's also seeing you and me. And so he prays for us. The cross was always the mission of Christ because without the cross, there's no salvation. Without the cross, there's no revelation. There's no word of God. There's no redemption for the saints. It all is a part of the mission of Christ, which is to die for the sins of God the world. Jesus does not come to the earth without his mission already being mapped out. The how, right? Coming to the earth through the Virgin Mary, the when, right? We know in time, we know in the Old Testament it was prophesied when he would come and he came at that specific time. This was, this was predetermined before he came. The where, we know that Jesus was born in Bethlehem in a very humble situation. But the most important thing about Jesus' mission is the why. The why at this very moment is what's on his heart before the cross. The why of his mission is the believer, is you and me. Those who believe in Christ, that's who Jesus is thinking about at this moment. That's who Jesus was thinking about. And when John 
writes down John 3, 16, for God so loved the world. You can put your name in the world there. For God so loved you that he sent his only son. That's the only motivation for Jesus coming to the earth was because he was thinking about you and me. This is the why that drives someone like Jesus to willingly die on the cross. So if you are a genuine believer today, you personally, I just want this to sink into your mind, you personally were on Jesus' mind in this moment in when he's praying. It's an incredible reality. And this shows us an amazing quality of the God that we serve. There are many religions, many gods that people worship, that people idolize, that people point to, that, that people uh, respect or, or revere as God. But it's only the true God, the God of, of the Bible, that has this amazing quality of faithfulness and love towards those he calls to himself. This is unique in the God that we serve, the true God. Psalms 89 verse 8 says, O Lord God of hosts, who is mighty as you are, O Lord, with your faithfulness all around you. That question, who is mighty as you are, is, is so... Uh, unique in its description of our God and that he is faithful and he is loving. So Jesus is praying for his future church. This is who Jesus is praying for. Not just you and me individually, although I believe Jesus can at one time Think of the entire church and also think individually of every person that makes up that church. Think about yourself when you have gone to prayer for a specific family or maybe your children or your grandchildren. You can think of all of them at once and then individually, right? I have four children. I, I can think of them at the same time and still you know, maybe if I had 10, it would be a little more difficult. But with four, I can manage it. I can, I can think about them individually as I pray for them collectively. Now, Jesus, being God, could certainly think about the entire church and individually at the same time. So there's no doubt about it. Jesus is praying in, in this phrase here where he says, I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. I believe at that very moment he is thinking individually as the collective church. Amazing. So Jesus is praying for the church, but what specifically is he praying for? This is the heart of this passage today. What specifically is Jesus praying for in regards to the church. We see that first in verse 21. Jesus says that they may all be one. That they may all be one. So Jesus is praying for unity in the future church. Unity. That is what Jesus specifically is praying for. When he's praying for you and me, he's praying that we would be unified as a church, that the church would be one in him. What's, what's, what's amazing about, the, about Jesus is that his relationship throughout the Gospels, throughout the Bible, with the Father, with the Holy Spirit, that that. That unity that we see throughout Scripture is our ultimate example of how the church should be unified, how we should be unified. It's the ultimate example for family, how a family should be unified, that, that neither one of us is better than the other, 
We all have unique roles. We all have unique, uh, we all have unique value. But we are all equal in the eyes of God. The, the church body, we are all equal. We are all part of the same church. Our foundation uh, and our banner is Christ. And so the, the example of unity is on display here in this prayer between Jesus and the Father. Verse 21, it, it says that they may all be one. And then here we have the example. Just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they may also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. Now, there's an amazing power in unity. There's an amazing power in being unified. Unity within a group of people points to an ideal. It points to a cause. Think about any group of, of, from the most basic example to to something that is very uh, palpable and, and deep and meaningful. Within any group, out of that group, the thing that brings the group together is an ideal, is, is a cause, is a purpose, is a mission, is a goal. That group is united and focused specifically on that mission or goal whether for the good or for the bad. There are very good, uh, meaningful groups today, and there are very bad, evil groups today. Okay, y You uh, can see the power in unity for both good and evil. And so unity within the church is vital for the outside onlooking world. Unity within the church is so important for those who are not yet in the church. Think about that. Because what they perceive of the church of Christ can either point them uh, to a beautiful picture of Jesus and his bride or a very distorted, warped, ugly picture of Jesus and his church. I've talked to countless people throughout the years about people who no longer want to have anything to do with Christ because of their experience within a church. This is why it's so important that the church be united in Christ. Because where there is unity, there is power. Where there is unity, there is a, a focus on a specific ideal. And Jesus says here in verse 21 that they may also be in us so that, this is why, this is why unity is so important for the church today, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. A unified church can be a catalyst for faith in an unbeliever. A unified church can be a catalyst for faith in an unbeliever. When the church is unified, it points to Jesus Christ, which is our ideal, which is our cause. It must be Christ. It must rest on the foundation of Christ, and it must point to Jesus Christ. This is why Jesus prays, for us to have unity. So, if our unity is pointing people to Jesus, if that's the if that's the goal, it's of most important that we are unified in the truth, in the truth. The Christian church today must be unified in the truth of the gospel. I want to talk about truth for just a minute here this morning. Truth in its self-defining word is not a broad idea, but a reality. 
when you say the word truth, just when you, when you hear the word truth, you're thinking reality, right? You're, if, if, if this light is on, it's not off. If it's hot in here, it's not cold, right? It, it's, if, if something is true, it's true. It, it, it is. This is why when Moses asked God, what shall, who shall I say sent me? God says, I am that I am. It's the very essence of being that is true. That is the definition of truth. So truth is not a broad idea. It is reality, which means it's singular. Today we hear a lot about your truth and my truth and their truth and my dog's truth and my cat's truth. There is only one truth. Truth is singular. It's, it's focused. It's reality. There is not more than one truth in anything. How many, how many of you have ever taken a test where a section of the test said true or false? Okay? How many of you have ever taken a test that said true Truth number one, truth number two, you know, whatever. That's, I didn't articulate that as well as I had hoped. But it's true or false. There's no gray area. At least there didn't used to be. Uh, I honestly don't know what it looks like now. I, I, I shudder to think what the public school system is coming up with. Uh, but we even hear about how in math, in mathematics, they're trying to... Uh, at least this is what I've been reading. They're, they're trying to uh, come up with ways to where you can solve equations without ever actually reaching a, a final verdict because if you did that, then you'd have to be saying that there is one singular truth. And because of our society and culture who is trying to undermine that idea of there being one truth, you, you got to start undermining it in all areas. you got to start undermining it in science, Mathematics, they can't do it in the laws of gravity yet. I, I haven't seen them figure that one out yet. Uh, but all of these uh, singular uh, truths that, that are very clearly uh, reality, laws of nature, uh, our nation and our society and our culture is trying to undermine that. So for the church, it's very important that we are unified in the truth. And for us to be unified in the truth, we have to be able to define what truth is. It has to be defined. We have to know the truth. And the only way to know something is to define it. If I want to know where the moon is, I have to know what the moon is. I have to know where to look. I have to know that the moon is in the sky. I have to know that I have to look up. I don't, I don't have any of that framework if I don't know that the moon is a planet in the sky. You have to know how to define the truth in order to understand the truth. John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus is the source of truth. He is the source of truth. He says so right here in this verse. And being the source of truth, it's not just the place where truth can be found. Okay? Because you can find truth in a lot of places. I believe when you walk into this church, you find truth. You find believers worshiping the true and living God reading from his true and living word. Amen? I believe when, um, when you do mathematics, you can find truth. Two plus, two plus two is always four. Two divided by two is always one. Okay, good. Uh, zero times anything is always zero, right? We know where to find truth. 
But Jesus is the source of truth. He, it's not just the place where truth can be found, but the actual reference point of all truth, of all reality. That is what Jesus means when he says, I am the truth. He is the reference point for all reality. In light of that, if you are not a Christian today, you will never be able to fully understand the meaning of truth. Here's the reason why I'm defining the meaning of truth. If we are to be united as a church, pointing people to Jesus, we cannot compromise in the truth for the sake of unity. We cannot do that. This is not how we are unified as a church. A church that finds unity by compromising the truth is not a church united, but a church divided. Because a church that finds unity by compromising the truth divides itself against the kingdom of God. Because Christ is the truth. And so to compromise in any area of God's revealed truth in his word is to divide yourself against that very truth. And so you can have compromised unity within a church, but that is disunity with Christ, which in essence is a church that is not united. Where you find the absence of truth, you find a people united to lies. This is why the church's unity, the church of Christ, if we have a desire to be united as a church, as Jesus is praying, the foundation must be uncompromised truth. Must be. This is the only way to have true unity as a church. This, this is the foundation. This is the starting point of having a church that is united as Jesus prayed. It has to be united in the truth. So what specifically does, it, does a church need to be united in? Well, there are, there are some very specific essentials that we all must be united in. When we think about unity within the church, probably the first thing we think about is Jesus Christ. We think about the gospel, the, the, the message of salvation, that man sinned against God, rebelled against the word of God, separated from God, and God graciously sent Jesus to die and pay for the sins of those who would be saved. Jesus rose from the dead. He ascended to heaven. And now man must repent and believe in faith that Jesus is Savior and Lord. This is, this is a very essential uh, unifier of the church, the gospel but a very key element to this unification that oftentimes gets detached from the gospel is that the church must be unified in defining sin. The church has to be unified in defining sin. Because you can't effectively preach repentance if you can't correctly define sin. How can I get up here and preach, repent and believe if I'm not able to define what someone is to repent of? If you cannot point to what the word of God says about sin, why preach repentance? It's a great question. 
And so the church must be unified in, his, in the gospel. It must be unified in the, 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 in the, the, who Jesus is, that he died on the cross, that he rose again, right? All of those essentials that, that Jesus is God, the deity of Christ, the virgin birth, right? These are core uh, essential truths that the church must be unified on, but also it must be unified in defining sin. We don't define sin based on experience. We don't define sin based on culture. We can't because we have to define sin based on God's word. And if we define sin based on God's word, then that goes above the culture. That goes above our experiences. That goes above what we've learned from uh, this, that, or the other. It, it goes above all of that because this is the revelation. This is, re this is God's revelation to us. And so we need to be able to trust in the revelation of God in, in order to define what the Bible calls sin. It's not what I call sin. It's not what you call sin. We align what sin is from the word of God, from the truth, the only truth. There are churches all over that define sin very differently. You may have Notice this in recent years. Sin can be defined wildly different from one church to the next. And there's only one reason why this happens. There might be uh, those that say, well, this is why, or this happened, or it, it all boils down to one reason, the authority of God's word. Is that church under the authority of God's word or above the authority of God's word? That's it. That is the only reason. There is a way to determine which churches are united in the truth and which churches are divided against the kingdom of God. This is how you determine that. If a preacher is preaching lifestyles, uh, affirming certain lifestyles that are contrary to the word of God, that church is divided against the kingdom of God. And that's a church that you need to leave ASAP. A church that is not basing its definition of sin on the word of God as a church divided against the kingdom of God. We go to the word of God. It's that simple. It's that simple. There are things that I've read in, in God's word that were described as sin in my own life that I had to deny my feelings, deny my thoughts of it's really not that bad, you know? There, there are things in my own life that I've had to wrestle with in God's word and, and at the end of the day say, you know what? If I'm going to submit to Christ, I have to take up my cross in this area. I have to lay down what I think is okay. And the only way you can truly do that is if you understand just how sinful you are just how sinful humanity is that Jesus had to go to the cross to pay for our sins the severity of our sin that that we apart from Christ are dead in our trespasses and so we must go to God's word first and foremost to be able to define sin we can't bring our own experience and and our own history uh, and our own misled uh, teachings from, from other leaders or other mentors that, that have taught us things contrary to the word of God. We have to always go to God's word. If I ever say anything or teach something regarding sin 
affirming a certain sin or even disparaging a certain action that the Bible doesn't clarify as sin. I hope that you would call me out on that. I hope that we could have a conversation because I am, I am not above reproach. I'm just a man. I'm just a man trying to follow the word of God. And my job is to, is to clarify the word of God, is to bring clarity to what's already been revealed, what's already been written, what's already been uh, defined by God as what sin is. My job is to clarify that, to bring light to it. And if there's any minister behind the pulpit that is, that is not doing that, or that is twisting the Bible in areas that God clearly points sin out, you need to be wary of those people. You need to be wary. Don't listen to those people online. If, if you start to hear things that are contrary to the word of God, shut it off, turn it off. Disassociate yourself from that. Because that's where the enemy wants to try to get in and, and that's where the enemy stirs up disunity within the church. So our unity must not be compromised in the truth. So the goal for us to be unified is to have a commitment to God's word. This is the main goal. The way that we are unified is in the truth, the truth of, of God's word, the, the truth of what God says about the gospel, but also the truth of what God says about sin and repentance and so the goal for us to be unified is that we as a church collectively must be committed to the word of God. I want to look at Acts chapter 2 this morning. You can turn there in your, in your Bibles. Acts chapter 2, starting in, in verse 42, we're going to read a few verses together. This, this uh, passage describes the church just after Pentecost. The Holy Spirit had come. Peter had given his sermon. And then this is a description of the church. Verse 42. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. This is a perfect picture of what Jesus prayed to the Father. What did Jesus pray for? He prayed that we as a church would be one. We are one by our unity. We are united together through the truth. And then Jesus' prayer for unity was so that those outside the church would look and believe in Jesus, believe in the power of the unified church that produces faith. What do we see here at the beginning in verse, 20, in verse 42? We see that they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, okay? The truth. What were, what were the apostles teaching them? What Jesus had revealed to them specifically. Jesus said before he ascended, 
Teach them to obey all that I have commanded you. The revelation of Jesus Christ was what they were teaching and is what they were devoting themselves to. So the church here on the heels of Peter's sermon, what does it say in verse 41 of, of chapter 2? So those who, were receive, who received his word were baptized and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. So here we have this huge influx of the church immediately. So the church is united in the devotion of the apostles' teaching, which then produces this unity on display. We see in verse 46, day by day attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, receiving their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all people. This is what Jesus prayed for. And then the result of Jesus' prayer coming to pass right here. Verse 47, And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. We see right here the power of not just a group of people together, but a group of people together unified in the obedience to the word of God. And that power produces faith in those who see a picture of a united church. It's an amazing picture. This is where the pattern of unity must start. A church committed to God's word in every aspect This is where it started in Acts chapter 2. It says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship of the breaking of bread and the prayers, right? This is the church coming together to break bread, to pray, and to what? Devote themselves to to the apostles' teaching. It's after this verse that we see all of those byproducts of a unified church. This has to be the core. That we have to be unified in the truth of God's word. This has to be our goal. God's word being central in every aspect of an operating church. I believe this is a unified church. Now in verse 24 of John 17, we're going to go back to John 17, verse 24 Jesus says, Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me may be with me where I am to see my glory that you have given me because you love me before the foundation of the world. A couple of things here. You want to know how great God's love is? He... he, had love in his being. Love is defined by God. We can only define love truly if we know God. God loved, it says that the relationship between God and the Father was before the foundation of the world, before God even created the universe. So before our timeline even began God outside of time for all eternity embodied love. That same love was poured out to you and to me. That same love, that's just amazing. And so the great hope of a unified church is in light of God's love for us. And we see on display here that Jesus, his desire is that we would be with him in all of his glory for all eternity in heaven. That is Jesus' desire for you and for me. What what an incredible, humbling 
reality. This is the great hope of a unified church, that we see Jesus praying to the Father that we would, would be in the presence of not a veiled Jesus, not, not when Jesus came to the earth, in a sense, his, his glory was veiled in his humanity. But when we see Christ in heaven for all eternity, we will behold his full glory. We will behold his full glory. Now, how can this be? How can this be? Let's look at 1 John chapter 3, verse 2. 1 John chapter 3, verse 2. This is our last reference passage today. 1 John 3, verse 2. Actually, we got we to gotta start before verse 2. We got to do this passage justice. We got a couple more minutes here. Okay. 1 John chapter 2. I want to start in verse 28. And now, little children, abide in him so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink from him in shame at his coming. Listen. What greater way to go into heaven? Actually, let me rephrase that. There is no way, there is no greater way to go into heaven than with confidence that you have finished the race, that you have run your course, that you have lived a life pleasing to God. Amen? Not wondering, you know, when the trumpet sounds, not wondering you know, if you're going to go up or down, right? Like, what a great, there's no greater way to live as a church, as a, as a child of God, than with confidence in your salvation. This is, what, this is what the Apostle John is talking about, that we may have confidence and not shrink from him in shame at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you may be sure that everyone who practices righteousness has been born of him. The Apostle John over and over and over again harps on this, that you know you are a child of God if you have a desire to obey him. That is a clear mark that you have been redeemed, your desire to obey your king. In verse three, in chapter 3, verse 1, see what kind of love the Father has given to us that we should be called children of God. So and so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, because we shall see him as he is, and everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. When we go to heaven, we will be purified. We will be, it says that we will be like God, not, not in divinity, not in deity, but in purity, in in all of his glory and all of his holiness, we can see that because we have been taken out of our earthly bodies into our new promised glorified bodies to be united with Christ for all eternity. This is our great hope that the church has today, face to face with Jesus, worshiping him in all his glory in our new permanent home unaffected by sin, unaffected by sorrow, unaffected by pain, loneliness, hopelessness, because we're going to the Father's house. Amen? Let's reflect for a moment on why Jesus prayed for the church to be united. Jesus said in verse 21 that the reason for this was so that the world may believe that you have sent me. 
The church united in the truth points to the true Christ. The church united in the truth is a part of God's redemptive plan. There is great importance in our unity today as believers. So let's be a church united in truth today. Amen? Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the truth that you are, that you are truth. And from that reference point of truth, we can know all truth. We can know truth through your word. Lord, let us be a church that prioritizes your word, that is committed to your word, that we collectively as a church can be strengthened and united in the truth of your word, that we can clearly define in your word how to obey you and how uh, to uh, uh, revere you, how to respect you, how to glorify you, how to bring you glory. Lord, let us be a church that the outside community can visibly see as a united church, as a church that is focused on bringing you glory and advancing your kingdom right here in this city. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.